uh, <laughs> often you probably notice we now have new microphones and new audio. Is it crystal clear out there, I hope? Yeah. All righty. And those who watch at home, it should be much clearer at home. You're not going to have that buzz in the audio anymore or the fuzz on the picture. So um, let's just see how this all works tonight. We have an audio technician with us this evening. So if you hear changes, squeals, this, that, they're still tweaking it up just a little bit. But he, he promised me in the back there that we won't get any squeals, right? Maybe? All righty. If everybody can rise, please. Mr. Colbert, why don't you lead us in the pledge? All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. Chief White. Good evening. Well, <laughs> it, it's good it, evening. Yeah, it's never worked that good. That well, I should say. That's great. If you'd like to join me in a word of prayer, please do so at this time. Uh, Father God, as we're observing all the fires throughout the state, uh, some locally, we, we pray for all those who are engaged in those efforts and uh, all the first responders, uh, Division of Forestry, and all the multitude of other resources that have lended hands and ask for your protection on them. We ask, Lord, for a restoration of the rain to bring this to a, a conclusion soon. Lord, we thank you for the ability to meet tonight and our elected officials and all that they endeavor to do, grant them safety. Thank you for everyone in this audience that you would uh, protect them and their families. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Chief, your voice is booming. It was great. It does. Sounds kind of like a pope. <laughs> uh, Chief, you also have an update for us. Yes, sir. I know. Pass out some. I'm give you an update on the wildfire that uh, incurred on April 8th, adjacent to the Live Oak uh, Reserve Association. I'm going to step you through a few slides real quick, give you a breakdown, a Reader's Digest version uh, of the fire in light of, t of tonight's meeting and not to take too much of your time. Uh, Linda, if you'd go to the next slide, please. You can see that we're in the extremely dry conditions right now, um, a very high uh, drought index. We're well over 500 points which indicates the threat of fires is very serious. Uh, it's coming close, not, not quite mirroring the 1998 season, but things are progressively dry. We do have a hint of potential rain, uh, perhaps over the weekend, Sunday, Monday. So we're hoping that uh, improves. Right now it's estimated about 40%. We're in the driest uh, drought conditions uh, for the month of April on record, so things are still, still progressing pretty, pretty badly. Next slide, please. This is a infrared graphic of the night of the fire. Um, it did expand beyond that, that uh, area as well. You'll see a little bit in the uh, two stormwater ponds to the west side of that map uh, that was consumed from spot over fires. Uh, that equates to 165 acres there. It began to the best of our ability uh, off of Live Oak uh, Boulevard near Sterling Creek. Florida Division of Forestry is the lead agency that's investigating the cause. We still don't know the cause of the fire. Next slide, please. Uh, this graphic shows where our concern was and where the fire potentially could have had to or still could head to, and that's uh, to the west. And our resources and our incident action plan was designed to protect the Akana area, Seminole State College, and unincorporated areas of Seminole County. We have predetermined what resources are necessary to do that in the event this thing uh, gets beyond its fire lines. This is probably the most telltelling sign. The slide on the left uh, is the one when I arrived, and uh, you heard me say on one of the news channels that the wind conditions were favorable, and they were for Oviedo. It was blowing southeast, 
and the East Coast sea breeze kicked in, and you can see a slide on the right, it came back towards us, and that was not a good thing. Next slide, please. That's just a graphic of our initial incident command post for the first two hours till we mobilized a, a new regional site over by the First Baptist Church. That is the firewall that's coming towards Live Oak right there. You can even see some host, master host streams that were deployed and in service. We were trying to get forestry uh, tractor plow lines around the fire. But a fire of this magnitude that's burning below and treetop level, the fire lines are not going to contain the fire. When the embers are up in the trees and blowing it a quarter to half mile away, you're just not going to contain it with forestry equipment. On two occasions that night, we had forestry tractors get stuck that we had to have helicopters drop water on it uh, so we wouldn't lose them or, or their people. But you can see that wall of fire quickly coming towards the, uh, the eastern side of Live Oak. Next graphic. Uh, that's about 100 yards away from the back of some of the structures. Next graphic. And that's the fire arriving. Uh, I think that's Willow Drop, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that had about a 35-foot setback uh, from the wildland urban interface. Next slide, please. And that's just uh, another graphic of the arrival. Next, Linda. That's a little indication of what I'm talking about with the embers and, and so forth. Um, this particular property, it did damage to the landscaping, uh, melted the pool enclosure. They lost their playground equipment and uh, trampoline, stuff like that. Next slide. But the house was okay. The house has survived. All the homes have survived. Another graphic of the intensity of that, that firewall. Next graphic. And one more. That's an indication of just how hot it was. So let me give you some of the statistics uh, reported 249. The first caller indicated they'd seen smoke for about 30 minutes, so it gave a little bit of time to, to advance on us. 500 uh, drought index, we're up to 516 now. Winds were 15 miles per hour, 20 mile per hour gust. Um, changed direction, as I told you. Our first emphasis was on the campground. Uh, folks did not have time to evacuate their personal contents from the cabins. They lost about four to six cabins in their trailers. Propane tanks were exploding. Um, we evacuated 40 people from the campground successfully. Um, a strike team was requested at that point in time because we knew things were getting pretty chaotic. That sent us additional fire engine companies from Brevard County, Orlando, Kissimmee, Winter Park. If you drove by Station 3, Station 48 that evening, you would have seen a Winter Park fire engine staff in our stations because we were so busy. Oviedo Police Department was instrumental uh, and active in participating in our command post operations as well, helped coordinating uh, traffic control uh, and evacuation procedures, which is critical in this activity because we need to spend time on the fire suppression activities. Seminole County SO and FHP also worked under OPD for those functions. We evacuated uh, close to 150 to 200 homes, the southernmost portion of Live Oak. Uh, peak period was about four hours, 165 acres, consuming about 40 acres per hour in fire. Uh, the greatest threat, of course, was the uh, Live Oak Reserve. As the fire settled in on top of us, we had ashes and embers falling all over the southern end. We extinguished dozens upon dozens of fires in gutters, on homes, uh, palm trees, landscaping, mulch, plants, vegetation, grass, sod, etc., as well as trying to hit all the hot spots where this fire was going to rekindle and start new fires. Smoke conditions were uh, pretty poor. You could hear smoke detectors in dozens of homes inside uh, going off. We're very grateful to the community. They heeded our warning and evacuated appropriately. We had three helicopters in operation uh, that evening. Uh, the next two, three days, I went up in one myself for several uh, daily morning observations as we developed an incident action plan for the day's activities. As I said, we were preparing for advancement of the fire towards the west, Seminole State College and the Lockwood Road corridor. Um, and right now, what we're dealing with is, is nuisance fires, uh, numerous uh, spot fires. We did have a fire uh, get into a, a little newer area Sunday Saturday night, Sunday morning, that was taken care of quickly. 
it's well contained. You've got years and years of decay and vegetation that is four to five feet thick, and it's literally burning below ground at the moment. So it's extremely difficult to put out. Smoke conditions are at the poorest first thing in the morning until the uplift in the atmosphere occurs and the smoke starts lifting, but it was really bad this morning over there. Uh, so I met with the HOA president today of Live Oak. Um, Division of Forestry had notified me this week that they fear that some trees will begin to fall. Uh, it's very dangerous in the area. There are uh, close to 20, 50 trees that are threatening structures if they do fall the wrong way. So we're, uh, they're working right now to get permission from St. John's to begin a, a private contractor to put these trees on the ground. So I was really pleased uh, with everybody's performance. We're still dealing with this and probably will for days and, and weeks to come. So with that, that's our update. Oh, great job, Chief. Any comments from anyone? Questions? No? Chief, excellent work. All righty. It is about 6.40 p.m. We're going to call the meeting to order. We have all members of council present this evening. Our first item of business tonight is a presentation on the State 434 uh, Safety Study, State Road 434 Safety Study up by the Delion Curve. Actually, I think it went from the Greenway to Magnolia, did it not? From Magnolia to Spring Avenue, actually over in Winter Springs. Great. All righty, Bobby, we'll turn it over to you. Mr. Mayor, Council, good evening. Um, my uh, presentation will not be as interesting as that one, but um, I will do my best for you. <laughs> um, recently, Seminole County completed a safety study, uh, as the mayor just mentioned, for State Road 434, running approximately from Spring Avenue, which I mentioned was in Winter Springs, which is just west of Vista Willa, um, to Magnolia Street in Oviedo. And I believe we have a map on the next slide which will show the, the corridor, as you can see there. And what they did was they basically uh, went and looked at each intersection and came up with countermeasures um, appropriately to, um, for improvements to improve operations for safety in the area. And I'm going to try and go through that as best I can here. So for the next graphic, some information for you. The corridor is about 2.6 miles um, total. Uh, the four-lane section, which runs approximately from Spring Avenue east to just east of 417, is about 0.75 miles. The two-lane section, which runs primarily through Oviedo, is about 1.85 miles. Um, daily volumes, uh, trips, through the area were about between 19,000 and 21,000 annual average trips per day is what we see through there. And as we all know, the main problem through the corridor is east and westbound pl platoons of traffic basically block people trying to get out of their subdivisions. Anybody trying to make a left-hand turn has extreme difficulty trying to get out during a.m. peak and um, p.m. peak times. Next slide, please. Um, a little bit of crash history for the corridor. And what they used was a five-year period from 2009 to 2013 for the whole area. There were 219 crashes total. Um, in the four-lane section, there was 123 crashes, um, 98 which were property damage and 20, with 25 with injuries. Two-lane section saw 96 crashes, uh, 70 property damage, 25 injury, and one fatality. The crash types uh, varied. Primary one was rear end at 69%. Uh, fixed objects for people running off the road was 10%. Went, then it went to side swipe, angle, left turn, and other were the uh, less prominent types. Everybody always wants to know about traffic signals on that section. So two were conducted as part of the study, one at Hammock Lane and one at Artesia. Uh, Hammock Lane was warranted for a signal. Artesia was not, at least not at this time. Uh, and just to give you an update on Hammock Lane, it is currently in design right now. I have seen plans for it, but it is a concrete pole, strain wire. They're, on, they're rushing it to get it through so it will not be mast arms initially. Um, one thing that's interesting about that intersection is, in the long term, they proposed a roundabout as the ultimate solution at Hammock Lane on 434. I think that's pretty neat. Um, but it's being proposed long term, ultimately, with the widening. Um, traffic signal, believe it or not, was considered a short-term improvement, so that's why it's there. Next slide, please. So what they did was, for each intersection, they went through and they, looking at each intersection, they came up with improvements and they divided them into three tiers. Uh, tier one uh, were projects that were, um, have a lower cost and a higher safety benefit, and they were a, sh a short-term improvement. Um, tier two, which actually there's only one of them, um, projects uh, recommended in the three to five, the seven to five to seven year period. And tier three are those longer-term, higher impacts, 
mainly had right away or other kind of uh, invasive uh, issues associated with the design. And as I mentioned, they had long-term alternatives as well, in which we all know what those are. It's the ultimate widening of the corridor and uh, the roundabout, as I just mentioned. One thing interesting they did mention that I think they ought to look at is for, to, to phase the widening, especially like from 417 to Hammock Lane and try and do it first because I believe it would be the, the easiest section, especially concerning right away. Next slide, Linda. So to start with the intersections, and I'll try and get through this um, quickly, um, starting at Vista Willow and working our way east into Oviedo, um, I'll just go through each one and I'll try to point out real quickly what they are. Um, at Vista Willow Drive, they uh, propose intersection lighting and signal head upgrades. And when you see intersection lighting in here, what that means is street lighting. A lot of the intersections along 434 don't have street lighting. So for this intersection, they recommended street lighting and signal head upgrades, and those upgrades are those yellow back plates, those reflective back plates that you see on the signal. So that's what that is. At the next intersection, 417, all they're recommending is, again, those signal head upgrades. Next slide, please, Linda. Palm Drive, now we're making our way towards the veto. Um, tier 1 improvements included to construct a left, uh, westbound left turn lane in the Palm Drive and to increase the sight distance. And when you see increased sight distance, what that means is just clearing brush away so that when you're trying to make, get out of the intersection, you can see further along the path for traffic. Also at Palm Drive, long term, they recommend a westbound U-turn um, just past the intersection. And I believe that's going to be a major uh, impact as far as right-of-way goes. So that will be more associated probably with widening later on. Um, at McTavenish Drive, um, they're recommending a direction median opening. If, what you're, if you remember Katie Jean and Manigan up on Mitchell Hammock, that's what that is. Also one like what the county installed up on Sanctuary Drive on 419. That's a direction median opening. So McTavenish Drive, they're recommending one of those as a Tier 2 improvement. Um, intersection lighting as well, and in, in, uh, site distance improvements. Pine Branch Circle and Terralago. Construct an eastbound right turn lane. Uh, again, directional median opening, and extend the, the uh, existing eastbound left turn lane. At Cranston Street, which is actually into a Winter Springs development, they are recommending constructing a westbound right turn lane, and then another directional median opening. And, uh, Understand again with these tier three, these direction median openings, this is going to have to be with the widening. These are major improvements. These, I don't think the, there's enough right away right now to, to make those happen. Are medians, Bobby, um, are they right in, right out? Yes, sir. So, so no more lefts out of like what? You're correct. What would happen most likely is the, the existing left turn movements on the, on the, on the, on the highway right. will, will remain. But if you want to get left out of a development, it's not going to happen. You'll have to go right and make the U-turn at the next directional medium. Similar to what's at Katie Jean right now, Katie Jean and Manigan. Same idea. Is there room enough to make U-turn? I don't. That's just it. I think it's going to have to be with the ultimate the widening. widening right? yeah, yes, sir. Oh, with the widening. Yes, sir. Okay. It'll have to. It's just you need so much median to make those turns. Right. Um, Clips away. That's a hammock reserve. Uh, another median opening. <laughs> you see a pattern. Uh, the Lady Bird Academy, uh, Ethan Hammock Court. Um, the state likes Another those. Yes, sir. Well, they're safer, right. really and truly. I mean, they're residents don't like them because they're inconvenienced. They can't make the left-hand turn. But in truly, when you make the right-hand turn and make a U-turn, it's a much safer movement, really and truly. Um, Hammock Lane, our favorite intersection. Construct a westbound right turn lane, which surprisingly there isn't one now. Um, construct an eastbound U-turn, which would be, again, with widening. Um, here we go with convert to a signalized intersection, which is, like, we, like I mentioned, it's in design right now. Uh, and then, like I said, the convert to the roundabout in the future. And I, if I mentioned it previously, the construction should be the summer for that signal, if I didn't mention that previously. N next slide, Linda. Okay. Uh, Laurel Oaks Court. Um, here we go. Install intersection lighting. I mean, this is, this is segment lighting. So basically, you're looking at a corridor lighting from Laurel Oaks Court down to Sweet Viol uh, Violet Drive, which is Avita Park townhomes. And at Sweet Violet Drive, you've got, again, lighting down to Artesia and construct a southbound right turn lane. And then Artesia, we've got construct a northbound right turn lane, uh, install more lighting, um, extend the existing leftbound turn lane, and then increase sight distance because there's a lot of vegetation in there. Next slide, Linda. Sweetwater Circle, we've got install more lighting and construct a southbound left turn lane, and in Magnolia, our final intersection is just installed the signal back plates. And with that, I think that's it, and do you have any questions? Any questions for Bobby?
Okay. Uh, one thing I will mention to you real quickly is I don't know what the timeline is. I do know that the county recently met with DOT to go over the recommendations. So I don't I don't have anything as far as a schedule or a timeline or anything. Else. Well, the PD&E for the widening isn't until that is like 2018. That was originally scheduled 2018 by the county mm -hmm. in their um, third generation sales tax right. projects. And then that's at least a year and a half or two yes, years sir. of PD&E. Yes, so sir. Widening is far off. Correct. Yes, sir. <laughs> Quite a ways off. All right. Thank you, Bobby. Yep. Thank you. All righty. Back up to our agenda. All righty. Next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes for March 6th, 2017 and April 3rd, 2017. I'd like to entertain a motion to do so. Move to approve. Second. Motion second. Any discussion? Do we need to specify that we're approving the amended minutes for April 3rd? The ones that were placed on the I, I don't think they were ever approved, so we're just. Oh, fine. the ones that are, were presented. Okay. Right. As presented. April 3rd? Or the meeting before that? Didn't we discuss it on April 3rd? The ones for the most recent meeting, there's a slight adjustment from when it was posted online until right now so there is a fresh copy with a minor adjustment in here okay. as presented any other questions hearing none call the vote all in favor of the motion please signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. opposed motion carries moving on we're up to our public comment portion of the meeting this is for items that are not on the agenda this evening and just bear with me a second while i get everything in order here because I do have one written request, and that is from Mr. William Lowe. Mr. Lowe? Thank you for your time and for making Oviedo as great as it is. It's really a very nice place to live and raise children. Well, thank you. We um, appreciate that. So I just need your name and address for the record first. Uh, name William Lowe, L-O-H, 2889 Strand Circle in Oviedo. Thank you, sir. Do, I, do we have a presentation on the? Do you system? have uh, the PowerPoint? Okay. Just give him a second. Reset his clock once okay, you get well. up there. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm an aviation consultant. I used to work for Florida Express Airlines. I don't know if anybody remembers that here in Orlando a long time ago. <laughs> I worked for Lufthansa, Deutsche Bank in uh, Frankfurt and in London. And I moved back here in 98 and started my own business. And can we have the next one, please? I just go to the next slide. Yeah, the title's concerns about Florida's water system. That's more than, more than that, but uh, we can start there, I think. Give us a second. Looks like the PowerPoint froze up. <coughs> it's over there. There we go. Uh, basically, <coughs> lived in Florida my whole life when I wasn't, you know, somewhere else. And I remember older guys when I was this big saying, you should have seen it before, Sonny. <laughs> so it's a, it's a really ugly decline over many years now. Too many of the gutters and the streets in, in our neighborhood and when I drive around Oviedo are really full of stuff. Uh, people just don't care, I guess, and that's not going to change. The, the main thing is on, when it rains enough, the, the driveways and streets and the sidewalks and the gutters becomes a giant, become a giant transport system. So all the fertilizer, pesticides, stuff, leaves, whatever it is, grass clippings, uh, goes right into the drain, into the lake, into the river, into the groundwater, into the aquifer even, and makes it, some, some even makes it all the way to the coast, into the Everglades um, since decades. So this stuff dissolves, feeds the algae, which then has a big party and eats up all the oxygen in the water. Next. I know what it says. Um, I, I haven't seen the street sweeper much in the last couple of years. I used to see it pretty often because you can't not notice that thing. It's huge. Uh, so I was wondering about that. Maybe we should get some smaller, more, more smaller electric ones. Uh, we could also consider trimming trees or cutting some down if they're too close to the street. And I was on the board before. I know about that. And you just don't have the power to make people use the blower. 
or to care. And we can make that problem go away right here. Next, please. With one of those, maybe, or two or three of those. Um, it only took me 10 minutes to find that. It's a used one. It's $8,000. It's in the UK, so that's kind of a hassle. But something to consider. You might know an airline, though, that you can put it on and fly it over to us. I, I would say, too, I'm, I'm in England quite a bit, or in Europe, and I can help locate things like That's that. That's carry-on? Uh, no. <laughs> the golf course. I'm very happy. I'm a golfer, or at least I used to be. I haven't played much lately. But it's, I think it's great that, that Obito has bought this golf course. I was so shocked when I heard that might be developed. And you've saved a lot of runoff by doing that. So the rest of this I'm going to skip because you can read it in this excellent report. Mm -hmm. And I hope you will. Uh, maybe we should work together with the Riverkeeper organizations. You can see two websites here. Uh, also, education is important, but in some cases, you know, it's not going anywhere. Uh, and sadly, the rainy season is coming. There's going to be more algae blooms, fish kills, and this starts right in front of our house or not. This, sad, I hate to do this to you, that's a picture of this <coughs> guacamole from last summer. Causes ALS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So. The bottom line is, if we ruin Florida, uh, Obito and our house and our business and everything here is going to be worthless. So I hope we can avoid that. Try. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lowe. Mr. Lowe, thank you for putting this all together and taking your time. Uh, I would encourage you, our public works director was the gentleman who was just speaking on the 434 widening. They have a whole team and a stormwater management crew. Uh, maybe if you can get together with them and they can give you some of the uh, programs that we do have in place already, and maybe you have some other ideas that they hadn't thought of, that would be terrific. We would appreciate it. Uh, Seminole County also is doing a fertilizer ordinance right now. I don't know if it's, do we know where that is? Has it passed? Uh, I think it's already passed. Passed, right? Yes. Yeah. So Seminole County already passed it, so uh, they're, they're working on it. And it's going to be something that uh, once the county passed it, it would probably end up going countywide through the cities as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your time. That's the end of the written request I have. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to address council on anything not on our agenda this evening? Hearing and seeing none, I'm going to close public comments and move on to the consent agenda. This evening's consent agenda are items 4 through 14. What is the pleasure of council? Mr. Mayor. Deputy Mayor? I'd like to make a motion to approve it as presented. <laughs> second. We have a motion second. Any discussion? Nope. Looks great. Bob? No. Nope. Keith? Good. And yes, there's a little discussion. Um, I think that uh, it would be wise for us to pull off four, five, six, eight, and 14. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Four no, can no. be done quickly. No, not going to happen. Why? <sighs> then let's go with number eight. What, what, what are the questions that you have? Perhaps you can just ask them quickly of Mr. Cobb. For 4, 5, and 6, I'm just hoping that you will read the proclamations by title only. Uh, the people for whose benefit the proclamations are made deserve a proclamation, I think. So that was it for 4, 5, and 6. For number 14, I just wanted to commend the developer for asking for only one architectural deviation under the new code, and it being only 8%. Uh, last week, we saw one developer asking for giant deviations under the new code, and I feel like in, in many ways it was written kind of how we wanted it to be written. Um, so here we have a redevelopment project going in able to follow our code. I love the, to see that the code works. So just wanted to say that part, but uh, eight is the sidewalk issue that does merit more discussion. So you want to pull off eight? Pull off eight. Is there any consensus to pull off building a sidewalk up and down Lockwood Boulevard? I don't see consensus. Sorry. Can I at, at least get my fill out? <laughs> The consent agenda is just that. It is the consent agenda. There's questions and items on the consent agenda. You should discuss them with staff beforehand so that all of your questions can be answered so we can... They're not, they're not questions. They're observations about the lack of need for a sidewalk and the opportunity to better use $213,000. Mm -hmm. 
but if everybody is okay with 26,000 square feet of impervious surface, then the consensus is not with my way of thinking. Nope. All righty, I'm going to call the question. All in favor of the motion to adopt the consent agenda as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Motion carries. Moving along, item 15, public hearings, we have none. First reading of ordinances, we have none. First resolution and only item on the agenda this evening, it's item number 17. It is resolution 3409-17. And just let me catch up here on my agenda, Mr. Cobb. And we will turn it over to you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Interesting thing about tonight's agenda, the two development projects that were on it are redevelopment projects, both of them. And so I think that was a very interesting thing. Uh, your City Council is requested, requested to approve Site Development Order Number 472-17 and Architectural Design Order Number 016-17 for the Stonehill Plaza development. Pro's development is located on the west side of State Route 434, the north side of Mitchell Hammock Road, on the east side of Lake Chesapeake Avenue, and as well as the south side of Clont Street. It has a total area of 7.348 acres. The subject property is designated downtown mixed use on the uh, future land use map, and it's also designated, uh, has two zoning districts, downtown mixed use city hall retail as well as office commercial OC. The applicant proposes to demolish the existing structures and develop the property with three commercial, with a three-building commercial plaza. I'd like to note that the uh, demolition is well underway and uh, nearly complete. Uh, building one is approximately 6,900 square feet. Uh, building two is approximately 7,900 square feet. And building three is approximately 16,865 square feet. The uh, proposed commercial uses include restaurant and retail and medical office are all located have been all located to the eastern portion of the property, uh, which is the mixed-use district city hall retail side. The parking lot and uh, stormwater pond are located, parking lot and stormwater pond are both located in uh, the OC portion, which is the west portion of the property. Uh, the site will have four access points, one on each of its frontages. Uh, the 434 access will be right in, right out. The Mitchell Hammock Road access will be right in, right out. The Clont Street and Lake Jessup Avenue access points will be full access points. Uh, the site plan does include deviations to the buffer yard, driveway spacing, the driveway width, loading zone, parking space location, landscaping, and signage regulations. I uh, would am happy to report with this project that there are no deviations requested to the architectural standards. Uh, the applicant also has made a special request. Uh, per the Land Development Code Section 8.7 D1C, and this is dealing with uh, buffer yard compositions. Uh, the applicant has asked that uh, the council grant permission through the issuance of the site development order to install a trek seclusions wood, comp wood composite fencing within certain buffer yards. The staff has included language within your site development order as well as your resolution. If the council wishes not to grant the applicant's request, then I would recommend that your motion include something to the effect to take those the, the language out of both, both documents. The staff has reviewed both the site development order and the architectural development order and they recommend approval with the condition that the applicant pay $19,200 into the city's tree bank as mitigation for the removal of large trees on the property. Uh, this condition has been included as condition number 10 within your site development order. It's recommended that city council adopt resolution number 3409-17. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. Applicant present. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Becky Wilson. I'm here on behalf of the applicant. I uh, also have with us members of the development team. I want to thank staff um, for, for their review and assistance with this project. As you all remember, we were here in December with a rezoning along Clont Street with the anticipation of bringing back this proposed redevelopment there at the corner of Central and um, Mitchell Hammock. And we're proposing, as you all can see, three commercial buildings with a mix of restaurants, retail, and medical office. Since we were here in December, we've had two community meetings, 
uh, and have opened up a dialogue with the neighbors. Accordingly, we've made changes, we've made a lot of changes to the plans, but I want to highlight just a few of them. Uh, the first is there, there was concern about the view of the project from Klontz, uh, in particular those uh, folks who live in Whispering Woods. So we enha enhanced the landscape buffer along Klontz by adding additional trees. Um, we've created and shared renderings of the Klontz Street streetscape with the neighbors. We're dedicating a triangle at South Lake Jessup and Klontz Street for future traffic calming, so that dedication is made to the city. And we added sidewalks along uh, the south side of Klontz Street, and instead of tearing out trees, those existing trees that are in the um, Klontz Street right-of-way, we moved that sidewalk onto our property so that that existing um, buffer can remain in, in the right-of-way. Uh, we also revised the location of the, the Klontz Street Drive to save a particular stand of trees. Um, that, that look great and, and were important to the neighborhood. Um, all of this is to ensure that we would be the least impactful on Klontz. As, as you can see from our design, there are no buildings on that area that we rezoned to OC. It's our stormwater, some parking, and, and landscaping. And then for those neighbors that were um, or that are adjacent to us and also in the downtown mixed use, uh, we increased the east buffer from 10 feet to 30 feet to be um, compliant with code. We increased the north buff buffer. Originally we had 10 feet. It, it, it varies from 20 feet to 24 feet for the buffer, but the setback to the building was increased to the 30 feet uh, by decreasing the size of our building three. Uh, we've made numerous revisions based on your staff's input, including adding a right decel lane um, uh, at the westbound Mitchell Hammock. So uh, with that, we're here. We're happy to answer any questions that you all have for me or our team. Uh, we respectfully request approval of the resolution along with uh, approval of the Trex fence. As uh, the city manager mentioned, we have uh, an example of that fence here. When we use the word fence, I want to be clear, it is completely opaque. It's not like a residential fence where you could maybe see in between the grooves, so we have that here if anyone would like to take a look at it. Uh, one thing we discovered is that our building one and building two, which are the buildings that um, are southernmost in the development, uh, our architects uh, overlooked our fire riser rooms. And so for building one, we just need to add 23 feet to the rear of that building so that our fire risers are enclosed. And then um, for building two, 41 square feet. It's a 0.2% you know, addition of square footage, but I just didn't want anything presented here to be changed in the future and, and us not make you aware of that. Uh, the last thing I'd like to, to ask, and um, Mr. Groot had, had reviewed the language and it was sent on April 10th in a letter to staff, and that is related to modifications to, to the ADO. As mentioned, we don't have any uh, deviations to, um, to the architectural uh, code requirements, but the language we're asking for that was in this letter is that uh, with respect to the City of Oviedo Land Development Code, Section 8.7, the land use administrator shall be the authority to approve revisions to the approved ADO plans to the extent that the general design intent's not modified. No new or increased deviations, we're not trying to get any deviations, and that a determination has been made the change is consistent with sound and generally accepted engineering and land use practices and principles, and there is no increase in intent city of use. As you can imagine, my request was much simpler and all that language is what at, um, Lonnie suggested we add. But just to be clear, we wanted your staff to be able to review if there are any minor changes to those elevations that, that have been granted. With that, um, like I said, I'd just like to uh, make ourselves available for questions and we're happy to address any concerns from the neighbors. Any questions of the applicant? <coughs> None yet? Thanks. Sure there will be. Thank you. This time I'll open it up to public comment. I have one request to speak for him this evening, and that is from Mr. Uh, William Wales.
Sure. William, we'll just need your name and address for the record when you're ready. Uh, good evening. I am William Wales at 446 Forest Trail, Oviedo. Uh, thank you for letting me speak today, and, uh, and uh, we're coming forward. Oh, here, let me, uh, I have a couple extra. Uh, so, going well, if forward. If I could just ask one quick question. Are you speaking for the group that's here tonight? Yes. Everyone's in agreement? Okay, thank you. So I'm actually here. Uh, Jim Ford couldn't be here tonight. He asked me to speak. Uh, sure. So I will. Uh, I'll go forward. Uh, so turn it over. The first uh, line on the thing is a uh, bottom line up front. Uh, the, as uh, Ms. Wilson has stated, uh, we, the residents and the developer and their team, worked uh, towards the success to make Stonehill Plaza at the corner of Mitchell Hemming 434 a success. Uh, and we want to see that developed uh, as much as they do. We just want to lessen the impact to the environment and to the neighborhood. Uh, so as we work together in, in the ways that uh, Ms. Wilson indicated, two areas of uh, concern remain, which I think you're familiar with, is the uh, dry swale uh, proposal by Mr. Ford uh, in place of the eastern dry pond on Klontz and uh, at the, uh, the deviation that came up on the buffer area for the fence uh, that came up on Friday that we weren't aware of at the time. Uh, so. Uh, turning the page uh, on the developer resident meetings, uh, it is, we appreciate the council giving us direction to meet uh, back in December. We've held several meetings, as, and even the owner, Mr. Gr uh, Mr. Hill, attended that, and it was very fruitful, and we were able to work and do a lot of things. Uh, the residents conceded on most major issues. There were a lot of things we wanted to do. Uh, we wanted to, you know, we didn't like the access, the parking access on Klontz and on uh, South Lake Jessup, since those are residential areas. We had traffic concerns, a number of parking spaces. We conceded those uh, for the success of the project and traffic con and other issues that were brought forward. Uh, and they addressed our concerns on the minor issues like landscaping and lighting, as Ms. Wilson stated. However, the basic footprint has remained the same throughout, and those two issues remained. Uh, so now I'll talk to those two issues. Turning the page, uh, the dry swale at, uh, lower, for lower, to, to lower Claude's pond that uh, Mr. Uh, Ford uh, presented. He uh, estimates that it will save up to 47 trees and the wildlife and habitat uh, is there in lieu of the upper pond, uh, which uh, is the home to squirrels, owls, uh, the pileated woodpecker, the red barcotted woodpecker, which are both uh, protected and endangered species that are uh, common to the area. Uh, and uh, I also want to point out, as I'm sure you guys are well familiar with, uh, your uh, ladies and gentlemen, that the conservation element of the uh, comprehensive plan has policies uh, which the residents feel should be applied to the development. And we think the city needs to address the conservation of the environment as approving. Uh, I mean, speaking to Mr. White earlier, he said, hey, his, his only thing is to say, does it meet the regulations? But it's the job of this board to say, does it meet our, con our comprehensive plan? And are we conserving the habitats and the trees uh, as we should to make this a tree city and keep it the, what, the way we came and way, the reason we moved here? Uh, and following the comprehensive plan will allow commercial development to be more compatible with established wooded neighborhoods that we have that make Oviedo the no, way it is. Uh, turning the page, uh, you'll see the comprehensive plan. I will not go into detail on that. I'm sure you're very familiar with it. Uh, it just says it talks about analyzing the natural conditions of proposed development sites, uh, trying to preserve native trees and habitats, uh, and, uh, and uh, wildlife as, uh, as best we can. And so that's where we go beyond just what the regulations say. We want to do a little bit more where possible to uh, improve on that. Uh, so turning the page once more. So we asked uh, a while ago uh, uh, for the uh, for an analysis of why it would not why this proposal would not work because uh, we were told it wouldn't work. So we asked for a professional engineer. So the the uh, developer brought forth his professional engineer. He, he analyzed it. Uh, and he considered that uh, it would not function, but he only considered it in one specific case. And it did not appear to consider the uh, alternatives, other, other avenues, uh, as per uh, uh, this, count, this board has mentioned, that we would like to think out outside of the box when we want to treat, preserve the trees. I mean, we have 15 to 20 inch oaks that are in that area that's going to be uh, cut down. Uh, 
Uh, so the concerns that we have, they only went down to a 2.6, uh, 2.3 foot depth. So we were wondering what the depth of the actual water table is. Is there any way to make it deeper, the uh, actual pond that's remaining, or, or the uh, swale itself? Uh, does it have to be one in four uh, rise? Or can there, is there some kind of combination that we can look at? Intuitively speaking, if you look around the neighborhood, you can look at the pond at uh, O'Reilly's Auto Parts. You look at the pond at, uh, that's being installed over there by the Grove, I can't remember the name of the Grove, off of South Lake Jessup, the new development. And you look, say again? Evans Grove. Oh, Evans Grove, yes. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, the, uh, or the, uh, the one that was at uh, Bojangles, which has been filled in now for uh, the Outback. Those were all much deeper than 2.3 feet. Uh, so intuitively, it seems like that, it, it, and they were dry. So it, it, it seems intuitively that the water table may be a little lower and may be able to support uh, that. So if we can know what that water table is and what the minimum setback be, be, uh, for a functional swale or a dry pond, or if there's an alternative that could work, and we just want for more exploration so we can preserve those trees. Uh, turning the page. Uh, you'll see that there is a uh, the two ponds that just shows the two ponds as planned right now, and that's uh, that shows you where they're located on either side of the wellhead. Uh, the next page uh, shows a proposed swale, uh, and it shows the gravel uh, mix believe that allows a filtration, uh, and which will help preserve trees. And then on the next page, you'll see a artist rendering uh, by Mr. Ford. It's a very very. Uh, Theoretical, but you can also see there if you look at the trees that are even, you can see the large number of trees that are being removed, and you see that they go from they are all 20, they're not all, but they're you range in size from 10 to 20 inches, which are large uh, trees that have been in existence, and they're elms and oaks and uh, such forth. Uh, and then the next page is an example of a dam uh, that would be that would help uh, increase the volume of the uh, swale, which I think they did uh, incorporate a little bit in their design. We're just wondering if there's uh, other avenues, if we think outside of the box, that could help preserve trees and, uh, co and coincide with the uh, comprehensive plan. Uh, moving forward, uh, we didn't know about We just saw it on the agenda packet uh, on Friday, late Friday, uh, when it was up uploaded that the Trex fence, and we were not aware of that. We, we uh, a wood composite. Uh, we think it should, an upscale uh, neighborhood or development should meet the architectural standards. But I guess it's not architectural, it's buffer. Uh, zones that should match the architectural standards around it. Uh, we're just wondering, will it have equivalent sound dampening? Will there be adequate physical separation? What is the uh, lifetime of uh, that? I just saw it has a 25-year warranty, which I think is a little bit less than a, a stone or cement fence uh, would be. And it also even indicates in its, uh, in its brochure that it will fade over time. So how much will it fade? Will it, in fact, fade and no longer match the uh, existing uh, Decor, or will it fade past the decor if it's planned to meet at some point? So it will, it will have an aged look. So it's designed to have an aged and deteriorated look over time, and that's uh, so that's of concern that it will not that will not look as well over time. Uh, so turning the page again, uh, our main issue is that we want to maintain the oh, the charm of Oviedo. We like the canopy, which they have worked hard to help us do. Uh, but we would like to maintain as much of the environment, the trees, the large trees that are inherent in that uh, eastern swale, uh, eastern, excuse me, eastern pond, and that we'd like to preserve those and the habitat that's there as well. And also the, uh, the uh, I guess, the, the buildings which you're trying to preserve as well and the architectural, by making these architectural standards, we want everything to, to match and be uh, of a uh, higher standard for Oviedo. Uh, that said, so the, uh, the residents just request that a uh, broader evaluation of the dry swell concept uh, and, uh, and maintain the uh, standards to which uh, we uh, all, all wish to maintain. Great. Thank you, William. Appreciate right. it. Thank you. All righty. That is the end of the written request. And Mr. Wells evidently spoke for all the homeowners in the group. Is there any non-homeowner? in the audience who would like to address council. Hearing and seeing none, I'm going to close the public comment portion. And before we go on to questions, let me just get a motion on the table. What is the pleasure of council? Mr. Mayor. Councilman? I would like to uh, make a motion to approve re resolution 3409-17 as written with the um, 
the the language in it for the you know the minor minor deviations on the land uh, land use administrator able to uh, to make those uh, those changes. Okay. I have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Councilman Pollock, you have the floor, and then I'm sure we have questions of the applicant. Um, I, uh, I, you know, I, I like the way uh, it's put together. Um, I know that there were some concerns from the residents about the uh, the trees. Um, you know, I, in my opinion, I feel like the uh, um, the developer has has gone above and beyond to try to to retain as many trees as possible. Um, and they've uh, uh, and they've worked. Um, I, I commend them for working so well with the, the residents on all their issues. So, so. all right, Councilman Britton. Um, I pretty much echo that. I I want to add that uh, Brian, do we know where the nineteen thousand dollars worth of trees will be used, replanted, and and could they be repurposed in in this area? <clears throat> Generally, the money goes into the tree fund, and the city uses the, the, the funds to purchase landscaping to, for various projects that we do. Uh, a good deal of the money goes to the Arbor Day celebration, obviously. Okay. And uh, then when we have road projects or if we're doing a landscape project somewhere within the city, uh, I'm not sure if there are any program landscaping type projects in this area at, right now, but it's something that we could definitely look at. Okay. Would there, uh, I, you know, I, I recognize that it's not something that's really uh, an issue that's pleasant, but I recognize that some trees got to come down when you do construction, but I'd, I'm just wondering if there's a way to reclaim some area and, and put some of the, the large uh, trees back or, or whether we can save some. Dave, is there any way we can save some of those trees or do they all got to go? Uh, Councilman Britton, we looked at that rather extensively. Uh, our design engineer is here who, who reviewed things. And uh, in response to what Mr. Wales suggested, we considered the type of swale they suggested. We actually made the lower level, in order for it to work, it would have to have certain check dams so it didn't slope too much. And we kept the bottom elevation as low as we've got our current pond design which is the required separation from groundwater for a dry pond to function. So when we did the analysis, uh, even putting gravel below the sloped bottom of the pond like it was suggested in their drawing, all that math in a 32-foot wide area without complete grade matching, we got 28% of the capacity of the pond. The actual pond we've built is only 100 feet wide or, or a little over 100 feet wide because the property depth north to south is 140, and we have a 10-foot landscape buffer, um, a 24-foot driveway, a landscape buffer at the north. So just by extrapolating, uh, if we go deeper, we have to go wider. Uh, when you bring it to its logical conclusion, it's virtually identical in size to the pond we're doing, and the gravel actually displaces water when you use it. It's got, um, I believe the figure is, 40% porosity. In other words, it's, is that right, 40%? So it's 60% stone, 40% water. So we looked at this rather extensively because, quite frankly, you heard $19,000 getting paid into the tree bank. Probably if that group of trees was saved, that wouldn't be the case. So we've saved what we can while still complying with all the St. John's uh, requirements, City of Oviedo requests, and trying to keep South Lake Jessup, which has a current stormwater issue and normal rains from having problems in the future. Uh, so uh, to answer your question, we didn't find anything we could possibly do to decrease that area of disturbance. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. That's all Anything else, Councilman Britton? Council Member? I thought it was interesting that there's a request for wider driveways than are required. And uh, since I'm kind of on an anti-pavement kick tonight, and, and at all times, because I think it impacts how much runoff there is, uh, I was curious if there was a way to narrow those or maybe compensate for the additional pavement by having one or two pervious parking spaces. 
what I'll tell you is I think that's an aberration of your code. Uh, there's areas of the mixed-use districts that are of a residential scale, and I believe that piece of the code was more geared toward the CA district and so forth where there's converted houses where you don't necessarily need a full-width drive. Your engineering standards manual actually uh, requests a minimum of 24 for most drive aisles, which is the safe width. So the driveways on Klon Street and South Lake Jessup are 24. The driveways right at the intersection for Mitchell Hammock and Central are 30. Uh, those are, uh, we have pavers in those, and that width just goes as far as the first row of parking where it narrows back down to 24. So your code does have provisions elsewhere to decrease pavement. For example, 20-foot parking spots, they typically encourage us to have two foot of overhang over landscape and have 18 foot of pavement. So as this prog uh, project progressed, we actually decreased impervious in several areas in response to staff's request. And I'll point out that we are uh, very much in excess of the open space requirement that your new code adopted at 25. I believe we're still over 30 percent. So we do have quite a bit of, of uh, pervious area here on the project. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, I've got to say, I am impressed that there are no requests for architectural deviations. So this is going back to staff. You guys came up with a good, a good new set of rules. People can follow them when they want to. Anything else? Yep, Deputy Mayor? Um, Mr. Axel covered the, uh, the uh, dry pond, dry swell, why it doesn't work. Um, and Dave, just to clarify, you said, because um, the letter we got from Mr. Wells, even if you dug it a, a foot deeper, it's still not going to work. Yeah. Okay. I just want to clarify that because I'm, I'm hitting the... I'm hitting the bottom line up front things that we got. So talk to us about the, uh, from the wall to the fence, why the change? Uh, during the design process, uh, we discovered in order to make the stormwater system function and in order to keep the finished floor at least a foot above 100 year, and if I trip, I'll ask uh, the design engineer to, to uh, interrupt me, but I think I've got it here. Uh, we found that if you are familiar with this property, uh, there's actually what you might call a, a bowl as you go north on Mitchell Hammock. The, the uh, existing structures and parking lots and so forth, for the most part, on the buildings that have been demolished, actually were built in the time when there were no stormwater ponds and dumped right into uh, the right-of-way drainage system. Uh, to the north, you actually had a circumstance where uh, the water would, and it was undeveloped area, the water would just settle. So in order to bring the property up to a grade where the storm tech drainage system that's under the parking on Klontz would work, the buildings wouldn't flood in a 100-year storm and so forth, there's quite a bit of grade matching at some of the boundaries because that same bowl effect exists there. So you're saying like the footer for the wall and stuff? Well, the, the against the, the duplexes to the west, uh, we have at the highest point, we have six feet of fill adjacent. That's the highest point, but that's only one spot. Uh, there's a couple spots on the driveway to, to South Lake Jessup where we have a maximum slope of the driveway, and there's actually about 20 feet of drop. You might not notice it, but when you go from where the edge of the parking is to the street, that's how far of a drop it is. So in order to level that out and not have an undulating uh, driveway that goes up and down, we've got a couple spots along that boundary where I think we've got uh, a retaining wall that might be four feet. In most other places, it's a little more modest. So during the design process, we were looking for a product that could be the retaining wall and a screen wall. And we were exploring, there's, uh, you had seen something some time back, Meritage didn't end up using it, uh, that Seminole Masonry met, uh, made. We were exploring a product that, uh, that uh, Florida Wall Concepts, which is based in Oviedo, Swell Construction owns them, uh, makes. And when we got samples of that product, we were displeased with 
how it fit with the high-end architecture on the buildings and what those materials were. And at the same time, we had feedback from staff uh, that on a project around the corner, the Central um, Avenue townhomes, I believe, there had been a brick wall that was actual brick constructed on the main road. And then when you turn the corner, there was one of these precast walls that was intended to look like brick, but them next to each other kind of created this, uh, I don't want to characterize someone else's project, but there were complaints and it kind of jumps out and kicks you in the head right. when you're driving past. So we were concerned about this. We couldn't quite match what we were doing on the project with the precast when they did the staining to match our color mix, it didn't really match. So we started looking for an alternative product that would be uh, still a complete screen, long life, high maintenance, e I mean high, low maintenance. Uh, low maintenance, easy to clean and so forth, and able to be constructed with a segmented wall. Right. So we got the engineering for this product and just explored it, got the samples, and the sample we have here tonight is the color it is when you purchase it. Mm -hmm. It actually is designed to fade, so it looks a little browner, but it fades to a gray, which matches the color scheme of the entire project. It's vertically oriented in nature, uh, and most of the project, when you look at the architecture, that's kind of the theme, is we have the vertical orientation of the fenestration of the materials applied to the building and so forth. Right. Uh, so we, this is also everywhere we intend to use it from within the project mm -hmm. is highly screened with, with uh, canopy and understory trees. So we were concerned about all the alternative materials that have a rough surface with all that landscaping and all that irrigation being an eyesore and a maintenance problem. So this is, is actually a long life high end product and we didn't get it to the neighbors. We actually had a tentative meeting scheduled with them I think April 11th. Mm -hmm we kind of sat down with staff and reviewed this product with them and didn't really have samples in and make the request till the seventh so it was just a late breaking thing right. but we feel it fits the architecture it's a it's a good product um, there was something similar but it's not as nice the racetrack used this material for their fencing but Trex didn't yet have this product that has this staggered look in it and has a little more meat to it so the physical product material right. is already in the city, but that fence is not. Right. Does that cover it for you? Yep. No, that's fine. Just stay right there. I have one, okay. more, I have one more question. So, Certainly. So I like everything about this project. I like that corner is finally getting cleaned up. I think all the things that will be planned in here, the residents will enjoy. One thing that bothers me about this complex, and I've said it from day one, tell me why we need this driveway on Klontz. When Certainly. We have, when we have three other very visible high accents. C know. Certainly. Okay, there's, there's multiple reasons, but mm -hmm. why don't I start from the what purpose does it serve from, from a technical perspective and not necessarily mm -hmm. the developer perspective. Right. Uh, so one of the things that occurred, um, we did a uh, methodology, uh, you have to do a methodology with your traffic consultant. So our traffic consultant gets together with the city traffic consultant before the project starts. And the city traffic consultant is geared toward your concurrency management system and the local roads are not in that analysis. So we had done a traffic study that did not include necessarily uh, what the impacts may be on Klontz and South Lake Jessup. We had to analyze what's the impact on our driveways and the road segments leading to them, but we didn't have the background information. After the zoning hearing, uh, the, the traffic consultant said, well, we have our methodology, but there's also these public concerns. So they got word uh, to us through the staff, please analyze South Lake Jessup and Klon Street in addition. So we actually performed some counts. Um, and I kind of chose where those would be to get a full picture, east and west of uh, Forest Trail where it connects to Klon Street. So we could see what's the situation on both sides of that subdivision entrance, which is kind of one of two. Forest Trail goes around to South Lake Jessup and on South Lake Jessup north and south of Klon Street mm -hmm. to see what the background was there. And what we found using the city's 
methodology. And, and when I say city's methodology, there's an accepted way of distributing the trips to different driveways and different streets that they agree to. So using the model that the city consultant uses, we're required to use. And what we found is that there's a couple of intersections that will, so to speak, fill up and stage during, during PM peak hours. I actually asked the traffic consultant, which the city consultant did not ask us to do, to look also at AM peak, because we're doing a lot of restaurants and you might have a pretty big AM peak, and to look at the average daily. What we discovered is, is two circumstances that will get people to go north on Central. Uh, so during the PM peak, and I don't know how many of you really drive north on 434 when you live in Oviedo during the PM peak, but what happens is the two turn lanes to go to westbound Mitchell Hammock kind of stage and fill up. And I think there was a presentation here uh, from your guys doing your adaptive signals mm -hmm. a few weeks back, and they talked about how they're working on that with these adaptive timing. But the reality is there's not room, at least today, to add another left turn lane at the PM peak. So what people have been doing, and we saw it in our traffic analysis, is if that clogs up, hey, I'm going to go north on Central and turn somewhere else, or I'm going to go north on Central and pull a UE or something like that. So we're trying to accommodate the people that will make the left during the peak hour can make a right in at Mitchell Hammock. We're trying to accommodate the people that go north, and th that entrance actually would alleviate the clog in the northbound 434 uh, turns at the PM peak. So the other circumstance we have, and we discussed this at length with our traffic consultant, is also during the PM peak, if you've got these restaurants and people are heading home from work and they're going to go out, uh, you have a lot of traffic that will use, as they're supposed to, the new traffic light at South Lake Jessup, uh, which is, I think, been funded by you guys and, and the south leg of the intersection is complete and now it's just the signals got to go in. So what happens is if you've been on Mitchell Hammock during the PM peak going east, there's an awful lot of traffic that stages to the intersection. A lot of those people that couldn't turn left because there's too much traffic going the other way can use the traffic light. And we were trying to make the full left at Lake Jessup be kind of a primary entrance because it's full access and there's a light. But it turns out that you'll stage up the, the left D cell if there's too much traffic during the PM peak. So the model, the city model that we had to use says there will be people that if they know this other path, they're going to go and make a left at the light at Mitchell Hammock instead of waiting in this long line of cars at South Lake Jessup. So all those folks can make a left off, off of 434 on the Klontz and make a left into the project. Now in our traffic study, we found that with the driveway there, if people make the turn on to Klontz and they're doing it to go to this project, there's no reason for them to drive further and go past the residential subdivision. So what's across the street from this driveway is four acres or so of undeveloped property that would probably space a driveway at about the same place. Um, we also found that although traffic on your road that somebody else is, is always cut through in bad traffic and, and that's just no matter where we live that's what we think. We found in our analysis that even with all the project traffic that the PM peak capacity of the road based on your uh, city uh, traffic plan even with the project traffic we're just a hair over 10 percent and most of that was existing background. So that brings the question gee, why is it so important to you if it's so few trips? Well, we have about equal distribution on the four driveways during the PM peak hour and during the AM peak hour. And our concern is if that goes away, those people that turn on Klontz are going to go all the way to the other side. Uh, those people that can't make the Lake Jessup left are going to go around and turn on Klontz and go all the way around or make a U-turn and we already have in our, in our project analysis, there will be people that say, I can make a UE and go in, go in and make a right. But that's going to clog up, and the U-turn 
takes longer and blocks traffic longer. If you stage up at the left turn and go on to Klontz, you're out of the way. So we're trying to distribute it, spread it out, spread it out maximally, which actually your comp plan says please do. Right. So that's why four entrances. Okay. Does that cover it for you? That was, that was wonderful. Thank you. Appreciate Anyone else for me? You're good. Thanks. May I have something from sure. your neighbors? <laughs> um, and since the, the public hearing was closed, they didn't want to get up, but asked that, um, that I present this idea, and that is to give us the $19,000 in order, this was for the tree preservation or the tree mitigation bank that we pay into, in order to plant larger trees. So we're planting right now 185 what are considered large trees as required by your code. And I guess someone from the neighborhood just suggested that maybe we couldn't increase the number, but if we increased the caliper of trees using that $19,000. So I'll let you all discuss. Or I have a better suggestion. Nope, nope, nope. How about you just increase the caliper, pay into the 19000 and everybody wins. You knew that was coming. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> it's on my question list right here. All righty. I'm sorry. Deputy Mayor, you done? You all set. All righty. Dave, come on back up. Hey, everybody sit back. Yeah, I have a list. Um, w let's talk about this fence. Sir, sure. I, I understand why I, I get it, but where is it going? Okay, so... No, no one's talking about where it's going to be. I'll, I'll tell you where. There's uh, two boundaries against the duplexes where your code specifies without council permission it's a, it's a wall. Now, your code you just adopted says it can be... Uh, faced with stone or brick and the way your code's interpreted, that's veneer and it doesn't have to be real stone and so forth. Mm -hmm. There's several areas where there's some retaining wall where there's no requirement for a wall. That would be the two boundaries against the homes to the north east of the project, which north happens to have... So that's where Springwood's. No, no, no. Um, northeast would be the existing oh, homes okay. that are at the corner there's of Klontz. Three or four houses, okay. Right. There's, there's three lots remaining there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a boundary that abuts commercial along the Klontz Street piece. So as you, as you go in on the driveway, there's several hundred feet where it's now the, the uh, I think it's a car repair or car lot type of thing that wraps around where the uh, outback is being constructed. So this fence then is more or less more internal to the project, not external to the project. Well, it's on external boundaries, but what I would say is the Looking required... Looking neighborhood is what I'm asking. It's, it would be... From their neighborhood, it's, it's the closest they would see it uh, would be where it touches Klon Street. There's a 140-foot length where it goes north to wrap around those existing homes. So it's essentially now looking at what we see up here on the PowerPoint slide. The, it's green, every the green home, boundary, it's that red line, is that? Every boundary that's not a road, how's that? Okay, I understand. Every, every boundary that's not a road. All right, so it's that red line all the way over to Lake Jessup, and then the uh, three homes on the northeast corner, or four homes, whatever it may be there. Correct, to correct. So. Um, what we in our and request, that's going on top of some sort of a retaining wall that's needed in order to level the retaining the wall varies. In some places, there's not much of one or none needed. Mm -hmm. uh, in some places, the the spot it's north of Building One in that area is the point of the most fill right there. Uh, so as you go further north, it gets lower. As you turn the bend and get out toward um, south of the ponds is is where it gets high again because you're dropping off 20 feet to get down to the So you're going to have Jessup. pond, road, fence, essentially. Pond, road, fence. Right, except in there there's a row of trees north of the pond, a row of trees south of the pond, and a row of trees north of the fence. That's fine. Okay. Okay. All right, I understand now. Um, I'll stay here until you tell yeah, me Yeah, no, I don't go anywhere. <laughs> okay, we... The, the talk about the, the, the dry pond and all of that, uh, 
the engineers here, you said, right? Yes. Somebody can explain it to us, and I'm going to get to that in a moment. How many trees are you actually saving? I mean, everyone's talking about how many trees are going away, but I thought there were a lot of trees being saved. There's a uh, analysis that's done by your staff uh, that works in two directions, how many credits and what the, the mitigation count is. So there's, I believe it's 26 total trees surrounding the wellhead, which is 43 tree credits. Mm -hmm. So there's the 43 tree credits, and those are equivalent two and a half inch trees, but I think it's 20 something trees. And there's 185 actually being planted on site. So what we did is space them where they fit uh, so every landscape island, except that you'll see in the deviations where we have uh, something in the way, like the, the clock tower or so forth, every landscape island has at least one large tree, typically two. Every buffer has the required number of plantings, uh, the buffers where we didn't ask for, for deviations to the actual buffer, which are only on the road frontage, Mitchell Hammock and Central. So all those other buffers have either the required number or more large trees. Mm -hmm. And we actually instructed the landscape architect to space them as close as reasonably possible such that they'll still mature properly. Okay. Let, let, let's talk about the north side of the pond between sure. the neighborhood and the project, because that's the concern. Certainly. It seems to be the last remaining issue, we'll call it. How many trees are going there? If you bear with me, I'll open the plan and tell you. Okay, tell me. Well, you're counting trees. Can I have the engineer come up? I don't have to count trees. I do have a chart sheet. Oh, okay. Never mind. So this will be easy. Okay, so there's two different buffer segments along Clont Street because your code provides for certain requirements where there's parking. Mm -hmm. They're a little beefier. Well, let's just talk about the pond. Okay, so north of the ponds, there's 13 large trees required and there's 16 going in, but we also have medium trees that are not required, but we are putting quite a few in. So what we've done along that entire boundary is the same as at other locations along Clon Street where we have a large tree, you know, a canopy tree, a medium tree, a canopy tree, a medium tree. So we've alternated them along the entire boundary. What about on, uh, <coughs> excuse me, what about on the uh, west side of the pond between Lake Jessup and the pond? What are we doing over there? Uh, at that location, we have the required number of large trees, and the street trees that would normally be required on Lake Jessup won't fit or would have wet feet. Mm -hmm. So we move them back onto the site. So we've got a double row of trees there. Now, some of them are the street trees that couldn't fit in the, the street. Right. So basically, that one is, is pretty well filled with trees also. There's staggered large trees, two rows that are staggered of large trees. Okay, then along the parking lot, what do you got going in there? Along looks the like, it looks like some are saved. I see some dots on what I've got. Um, well, keep in mind that north of the parking lot, uh, you're in the area where Clon Street, as you kind go east, north. curves north. Mm -hmm. So we actually have a 16.8 foot area where there's typically a 10 foot buffer, but we didn't show any of those trees as saved because we have to grade match to get to the road. So all of the trees that are in the existing right-of-way, and it's a substantial quantity of large canopy trees, uh, we've got our grading such that there's no wall there, and all those trees are saved, but we don't get credit for saving the city's trees. Right. That's the city's trees. Okay. Uh, now, Becky had mentioned we had a lot of uh, back and forth with your staff about where is the sidewalk going to go, and it was challenging because we can't put a sidewalk on site that, that doesn't meet ADA. But the public road's allowed to have one. So we've got a sidewalk in this design that's on the south side of Klontz until you get to our parking field. And there's no 
trees on that area of Clance, it's kind of in that area there's a whole bunch of underground utilities for the city's water supply. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's not that many trees. As you get to the curve in the road, there's a lot of existing tree canopy on Clance Street. So if we put the sidewalk there, we'd be obliterating these old growth oaks. So the sidewalk comes <coughs> internal there and goes to the south side of the property and runs into the project where that sidewalk system actually connects, I think it's two connections to Central and two connections to Mitchell Hammock internally with either stamped or cross-hatched pavement all the way through the project. And then the sidewalk eventually weaves its way over to Lake Jessup somehow? The sidewalk comes from Lake Jessup along, along the south side of Clont Street until okay. it goes into the And then it goes project. into your parking lot. And it goes from, into the parking lot, and then correct. from the parking lot, then it goes back out over to 434, and then from the parking lot, it heads south to Mitchell. Correct. So, so if we, for example, when we looked at, gee, can we really do this sidewalk internally? Well, to meet ADA, you have to have switchbacks. Mm -hmm. To have switchbacks, you need more width. If you have more width, you push the driveway further away, and you cut down more trees. So there was kind of a sensitivity analysis. Where can they go? Now, we did have... Um, when we had our first draft plan submitted and had a, a meeting with the neighborhood group, we didn't have this screen of trees north of the ponds because there wasn't a buffer requirement there where they were necessary. There were large trees required, but the understory, there is no requirement. So in response to those concerns, we put medium trees along that entire boundary to maintain that same planted buffer, so to speak, the entire length. Now, for some of that length, it won't be terribly visible because of the existing planted trees, not planted, natural trees mm -hmm. that are in the Clon Street right away. So as you go toward the parking and the road curves north, we actually have a cloud on our plan that says don't touch this area. Okay. So all that remains until you get all the way up to the driveway, and we actually, I think Becky had touched on it, we shifted that driveway um, a little bit east because there's this clump of four trees. Unfortunately, one of them bends right over where the driveway would be, so we only have to take out one tree that bends over it. But the big, there's a couple of big 24-inch trees and another tree that are just gorgeous right there. So we shifted things around to keep those trees. Okay. Um. Pervious brick entrance roads. Didn't I see on the original plan that the entrance road had a lot of brick in it? There's pavers. I don't, I don't believe they're pervious pavers. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I will tell you, there's been a lot of talk about what can you do stormwater-wise, a lot of question about it. And there are a lot of things we are doing. One of them is all the drain pipes on the core of the project where all the buildings are in that parking field all those drain pipes getting up to the infiltrator system are all perforated pipes surrounded by gravel. In other words, to perk as much as you can into the ground and decrease the load on the StormTech system, which decreases its size. Okay. Uh, so the entire parking field up there, which is the area where we don't have a substantial amount of underground utilities and so forth, that entire area is under parking retention. And that, you know, if you think about it, you have to clear it for the parking anyway. Mm -hmm. So we're using the area under the parking for storm. So it really doesn't make a lot of sense up there to have pervious because we have the stormwater under it already. Okay. But on one of the original drawings we saw, the entrance road looked like it was all pavers. Is it is. still pavers? Yes. All right. So run the, the two main entrance roads are pavers. Right, so Entirely. from Mitchell Hammock to from the Mitchell parking Hammock lot, to the 434 to the parking lot. Correct. It's all papers. Correct. Okay. Um, I see you added a right-hand turn lane. That was probably a good choice on Mitchell Hammock into the project heading west. Um, uh, e uh, yes, westbound, correct. Westbound. Now, before I get into, uh, I just want to hear one more time why this pond won't work, but uh, there, there was an offer, well, let me rephrase. What caliper trees are you planting around the pond? 
you know. Most of the trees are what the city requires, which is two and a half, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, yeah, one I know, of them I, I know all the reasons. The young trees, they grow better and they root better and blah, blah, blah. I understand that. But there was a, there was an interesting offer made yes. of, of spending more money for larger caliper trees, which I think is very generous of the developer to offer. So can we plant larger caliper trees along the pond? Can we? Will you? Um, I don't know that they're available in the species we've chosen. I don't know that they'll be as survivable. I don't know that it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that it really changes the, the screening effect of what we're planting. So the renderings we did on purpose, I uh, had the landscape architect provide the exact planted size to our, actually it was our building architect that had the technology and capacity to do those renderings. So those renderings, and we've brought some tonight, and I think the staff may have provided them to you, have the actual at the day of planting size of these trees, which creates a pretty solid screening effect along there. So those trees will grow. And so considering the amount of payment into the tree fund and a lot of the other expenses hitting us on this, I don't know that I have the authority to sit here and offer more money, especially if it's not potentially feasible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for now. Is that okay. it? Uh, I'm good. I want to hear from your engineer. I want him to tell me why this pond doesn't work. Just explain it to us in Reader's Digest language because you're the guy who has to stamp it. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to come up here. My name is Bob Ziegenfo, 708 East Colonial Drive, Orlando, Florida, 32803. Um, I'll kind of just uh, expand on what was spoken about earlier. I'll, I'll start with um, we were involved in the uh, redevelopment of the Bojangles site as well. And so with the uh, data that we obtained during that project in conjunction with the data we contained dur obtained during this project, and the data I'm speaking of is groundwater levels, um, physometer testing, those types of things that tell us what the groundwater is doing in this area, um, we've got extensive amount of information uh, for this entire northwest quadrant of the intersection. And really what you see happening is this groundwater table starts high on the, the east side and does way, work its way west down towards the Dudasad farms. Um, and I'll add, uh, you know, the, the Bojangles site was uh, referenced as being redeveloped as an outback steakhouse now. Um, it was mentioned that that pond was dry earlier. That was not a dry pond. That was wet. Um, so and the, the elevation you're seeing on that site and the, the elevations we've talked about here today in order to elevate those sites up high enough above that water table is what's driving the need for retaining walls that you're hearing about tonight. So as we started to take a look at, uh, number one, maximizing the amount of area that we were already clearing, and that is what Dave referred to with the underground collection system that transmits the water from the parking lot over to the underground exfiltration system, all of that itself is another exfiltration system. So we've maximized the amount of underground we can do, and then we started looking at the retention ponds. Um, the simplest form I can put this in is a swale is, if you think about what a swale is, and it, it's more of a transmitter of water from one place to another, not necessarily a holding pond. Uh, so it really, the, the simplest of terms I can bring it down to is a swale provides much less volume than what a retention pond will provide. Um, added to that, it's a little difficult to see on these drawings here. Um, thankfully, I just started wearing glasses so I can see a little bit better. But you see some of the, you'll see the ponds and you'll see the lines around the ponds that, and you might be able to see better on your screen there. Those are kind of showing the pond areas. You'll notice that there's this blank white space on the plan that you're looking at uh, around those ponds. And if you look at our grading and drainage plan, that is taken up by grading down to the pond to even get to that point that you see there today. So not only with the letter that I provided that I think that you have all seen, that kind of analyzes, it is just one scenario, but it is kind of the best case scenario. If you were to look at a swale, what is the best way to do it to get the most volume and get closest to what we need to meet the city's requirements and the water management district's requirements? That's what we looked at there. Um, and unfortunately, you know, as was spoken here earlier, it doesn't even reach 30% of the capacity. The way those ponds are designed, there really is no excess capacity in them. We are accepting uh, not only the site's drainage, but also the sites to the north and east that we were talking about screening those four residential homes. 
we are actually having to take on that stormwater as well uh, because there is no way to bypass it around the project. So there is additional off-site flow that we're taking in that is adding to it. That off-site flow is directed um, to that upper pond that we've been discussing tonight. So really it becomes a question of whether or not you can provide the necessary volume by doing a swale and it's just not, the area is not there to be able to provide that volume. Okay. So you wouldn't be able to design it and stamp it that um, the pond would meet all the requirements. That's what you're saying. There's no way to do it. Oh, correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I, I've, I've sealed the plans that are for you today. They've been approved by the Water Management District as well. And they show, what they show is what's common here is a foot of freeboard. And what that's accounting for is the settling of the pond berms over time. Mm -hmm. So there, when you look at the 100-year storm event and protecting from flooding, there's what's called a foot of freeboard there, which means there's an extra, an extra foot for that pond to settle in the future. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Dr. Korea, can I ask you a question, please? How are you Good tonight? evening. It, it was suggested earlier that uh, we're not adhering to our comprehensive plan. I don't see any comp plan deviations being asked for. Are we adhering to we our comp plan? We don't deviate from the comp plan, and the, the project is absolutely compliant with the comp plan. Right, 100 percent. Yes. Right. And there are no endangered species. By the way, that's something that we have to check at the zoning. So in the zoning, when the project was rezoned, uh, we had to have an environmental assessment. And we have the report here that did not re identify any endangered species in the, on the project. And our environmental consultant has confirmed that. Mm -hmm. So most of the projects that uh, we approve in the city, what caliber trees do we require that they plant? We require 2.5. That's okay. the minimum. But um, if the, the developer would like to um, provide a, a larger uh, caliper, then it counts as more trees. So if they have the flexibility to, you know, review their project and try to uh, provide uh, higher calipers, they can decrease from the amount that they would pay into the tree bank. Right. So you would be requiring, I think the number was... 16 or something, 16 trees at two and a half inches, but if they went to a four inch tree, it's going to actually be less trees. Less trees, yes. So 16, two and a half, especially if they're of an oak species uh, that are going to grow pretty quickly over time, will eventually make a fuller canopy. Is that the theory behind our? Yeah, it will be quicker, right, if you have a, a larger uh, canopy, canopy tree. But, uh, or larger um, uh, caliper. Uh, caliper. Uh, I think what we've heard is that the, the um, developer is not, um, or the, the uh, representative is not sure of that the species that they are proposing uh, would have uh, um, a larger caliper to, to provide. So that's something that they could investigate or they we would be open to have the flexibility to work with them. Right. So we, so we do it by total inches. So if the ask was for larger caliper, it could end up being less trees. Yeah, and this is for the restoration. So what we do, we, we identify all the trees that are being removed, and we, they have to identify the caliper. Mm -hmm. And according to the caliper, that accounts for, as, for the amount of trees. So usually when you remove trees, you would have to replant if you're replanting with a 2.5 caliper, you have to replant many more trees than you are removing because they have different calipers. So if they replant with a larger caliper, then decreases the number of trees that they would have to replant. Okay. Oh, and okay. our calculation for the, for the tree bank is the same. It's the, the, the final number of the trees that they would have to replant. All right. Thank you, Dr. Green. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if, if I could ask a question as well. Sure, go ahead. So if they were to increase the caliper of the trees one at a time, could they sort of find a break-even point on a graph where they have, uh, where they don't have to pay into the tree bank, but the caliper on site is increased? They, they could. Is that they, they, we need to be sure that the trees will survive, right? Mm -hmm. So usually they start small because they will grow. And, um, and it's more expensive. So, but it would be a break-even proposition for the developer. If it wouldn't, I've seen it. I've seen that it might not be. I, yeah, we would have to see the the. the, the okay, so there there's availability that's a concern and survivability. The uh, truth is that you cannot replant all the trees. 
right, that you're removing because there is always a loss of trees. And that's why we have the tree bank so that the city will do the balance. So we'll get the money and, you know, our um, public works will have this money is, is going to be dedicated only for trees and we'll be planting trees, you know, in the city to kind of balance, you know, the loss that we have in a specific development. And how long do they have to keep the trees alive? How long is their bond on the project? I, I don't know if it's a bonded thing or how, how that works. The two years. Yeah, two, but two years? Cause two years to bond, right? But they have to... Because so forever, if a tree dies, they're on the hook. To the, 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 whoever owns the property at that time yes. must replace it. Yeah, or they, they remove trees, our code enforcement. Um, okay, um, and if a tree people. dies because it makes it, you know, say it makes it two and a half years, a tree dies, uh, what obligation does the developer have then? Um, what happens is that the site will become a non-compliant at one point, right? I mean, if, the, if there is a disease, we usually have our arborists would check if a tree dies, you know, and if they should replant the tree. So well, they should, then. but uh, for, for the longevity of the site and, and just for the reassurance of the neighbors, knowing that there is a plan that this screen will be there forever, I think is kind of what people are are hoping to get some Well, but this is for them. every project, right? So when, once the project is done, then we have our code enforcement, you know, okay, so the checking code enforcement the city. Issue. Yeah, that's what, okay. something that we do every day, checking that there are no trees being removed, you know, and if they are, we have Well, not no, removed, just dying. It, well, but then they will be removed at one point. They will, you know, and, and there are projects that when we, they come to us to do something, to do, a, you know, a, 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 any addition or any renovation or something, we'll identify that they are missing some trees and they have them to comply with the code. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any questions for Dr. Creer? Thank you. Good. All right, Dave, one more question for you, if I may. Sir? What species of trees are you planting around the uh, We have a mix. There's some oaks, some magnolias. We've got some cypress. We've got cedar and so forth. So uh, we purposefully actually on this project tried to get rid of the uh, bland uniformity of everybody uses the exact same oaks. Mm -hmm. uh, so right now I just don't know availability of those other sizes. Uh, so it is correct what uh, Dr. Correa said. If we suddenly change the sizes, the math changes. Uh, so certainly can we look at that? Certainly we can. I just can't tonight say, yeah, we can get those. And if you'd like, I'd go into the reasons it's a concern, but you said you know what they are. For everyone else's benefit, would you like me to? Go ahead. Okay. So uh, at the time of the last peak of development, let's say, 2005 or six, there was a lot of capacity in the market for trees and nurseries and so forth. When the market collapsed, here's all these nurseries with all these trees, and there was nothing going on, very little. Maybe there's some public projects. Maybe there was some Disney projects and so forth. A lot of those folks uh, either went out of business or stopped planting trees. So now what you have, unless you go really far afield, is young stock, which is smaller trees. So it's really, really hard to get larger trees. And there are certain projects that tend to, in one fell swoop, suck up huge quantities of trees. For example, I-4 Ultimate. Uh, is a huge user of trees. So you find yourself competing especially for larger trees. The other thing that happens is the larger trees with larger root balls are heavier, are harder to establish, and have lower survivability. So can you even get that? Is it going to survive? So it might be counterintuitive, but if you look at some projects that, hey, let's plant some six inch trees, which counts as three trees, and believe uh, you can believe me, I discussed this with the landscape architect. Can't we do this? We wouldn't have to pay into the tree bank and tried to do some math and it was, it's not available, you won't plant it right, it won't survive right, it's going to die, more of them will die. And if you look at the project in four or five years, where you planted the smaller trees, the trees will be bigger because it has higher survivability and less problems. Like I said, that's counterintuitive, but just here tonight, uh, Dr. Correa came over to me, gee, Dave, what's wrong with agreeing to consider this? I said, nothing. I just don't want to lead people to believe we're going to do this uh, if we can't do this. 
so we looked at where else could we plant more trees when we were doing this project. And we can't figure out where they can reasonably go. The larger landscape islands in the parking lot have two. Uh, the smaller ones have one. The buffers have beefed up uh, tree counts where they can uh, reasonably fit. But because canopy trees don't provide a visual screen, we intersperse them with the sub canopy or the smaller medium to get that visual screen. Uh, well, they've got so many trees, it's a little berserk because in Oviedo in the park, you have no open space requirement and diminished buffers around the perimeter. And in your code, you haven't quite updated that yet. So they took so long, and you recall, there was a problem with the engineering design team. They took so long to design, I, I told them, that's nuts how many trees you're planting there. And it was, we have no time to talk about it anymore. We're just putting all of them on Mitchell Hammock Road. So we tried to apply on this project a little more consciousness to where trees are. If you consider the, the renderings in the back, and they're a little hard to see from here, uh, where we have the knee wall, we have the trees exactly spaced between the columns. On, on the columns, there's lights. So we looked at every location where you could plant trees, okay. uh, believe me. And yes, is it possible to consider higher caliper? Absolutely. Uh, can I promise tonight it's it's practical? Uh, no, because of all those considerations. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody have any other questions? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I don't have a question, but I have a typo to point out before we consider anything that, that looks like it may be a legal document. Uh, number 19 on the second to last attachment there is, uh, in text it says 43 feet, and in parentheses, 44. So it, it's a, t a request for a 12% deviation, but since it does appear to be a legal document, wanted to make sure that we reconcile that. Which number benefits the city more? That's the number we'll keep. <laughs> <laughs> Which attachment? It's the second to last one. 19, she said. Paragraph. It's exhibit one. She's it. talking about the site development order, Mayor. It's uh, yes. condition 19. 44? Okay. Okay. Can we fix that Scribner's error? Uh, yes, sir. The resolution gives us the ability to do that. Now, in uh, Mr. Cobb, it's been so long since the motion was made. Did we add that additional square footage for those risers in the motion, do you recall? Uh, Mr. Pollock did state to uh, adopt with uh, giving the land use administrator the authority to approve the minor uh, deviations to the Okay, to so the that's, that's the motion you need. So we don't have to come back over 20 square foot for a pipe that the fire chief's going to require? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Good. Hearing none, motion on the table is to adopt. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All righty. Ten after eight. Let's move on. We've got uh, no discussion items tonight. Uh, Mr. Cobb, you're up. Mayor, I hate to disappoint you tonight, but I do have a, I do have some report. Do um, you really? Yes, sir. I Are do. you sure? Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, Seminole State College has asked to have a uh, meeting with uh, the city council. Uh, back on May 31st, they had a, uh, a summit to talk, to discuss a, um, where they want to go with the Oviedo campus. And um, they, um, no one was able to attend that summit on that Friday morning. And so they would like to have a meeting with us. Uh, we've been discussing several meeting dates. And I suggested that we do an off-council meeting date rather than a council meeting date. Uh, they've, off, they've asked for June the 12th, and so I wanted to give you plenty of notice uh, in case your calendars, there was some type of conflict with your calendars, but they want to come in and probably be an hour to possibly two hours to discuss uh, brainstorming for the Oviedo campus. And so I wanted to bring that to your attention that they've asked for June the 12th, and if you could check your calendars, let me know if there's any, uh, any conflicts that may go with that. Uh, Mr. Cobb, I can tell you I will not be in town on June the 12th, but don't hold up the meeting. Brian, me. hold up the meeting because I will not be here either. Okay. <laughs> there you go. I might not be either. So, all right. <clears throat> That's good. 
I guess we, are, we only have one meeting in July, right? Because uh, uh, you've got the you've got the July meeting at the end where we set the tenant. I'm sorry. We have the meeting at the end where we set the tenant. We actually no, we have two. We have two meetings. Right. We only have the one meeting in July on the 17th because the fourth is on a Tuesday, which means right. Monday will be off. So perhaps we can do it the 10th. Possibly. 10th or the 24th. We're having a special meeting that Wednesday. Maybe you can take a look at that. Okay. We can definitely look at that. What day? Yes, 24th would be better. Of July? Of July. Yes. I should be able to do that. Oh. Can I just see that? We have a special meeting on the 24th budget session is what my calendar shows. Well, the, the, that meeting is the meeting that we traditionally set the tentative millage for the budget. So that's a very quick meeting. We could... Combined with oh, we're going to be here anyway, right? Right. We just we set the millage, and then we could just break right into it. Yes, sir. We can oh, do okay. that. I'll offer them the twenty. Let's see, see what work. you can okay. do. What else, got, Mr. Cobb? Uh, Mayor, as you know, last Thursday we uh, closed on the golf course purchase, and I wanted to tell you that uh, it took a team of a lot of people, and I wanted to thank them. I wanted to thank Mr. Group. Uh, sorry he couldn't be here tonight, so Mr. Colbert, if you would pass this along to him, he was our point. He was our point man, and he he went out of his way to make sure that this project worked. And I just wanted to thank him. I also wanted to thank the council, uh, including former council members uh, Shank and Drago, because over the past four years, you have provided the guidance that I needed, gave me confidence to move forward with the property owners and to continue uh, with the project. And even with our new council members, the way that they jumped in and got themselves up to speed on this to knowing that the other three had been there for four years, it was, council really made a huge impact, and I wanted to thank you for that. I also need to thank Mr. Boop and Ms. Jones in the finance department, because they really worked diligently and worked very hard uh, putting together the financial packages to make this work. And I'm, as soon as the, the contract was signed, uh, Mr. Bowler and Mr. Moore went to work, uh, during the 10-day due diligence period, and they made the most of it. And they found, they went out and they went over that entire course and they brought back, they went and they got, they got us in a position to where we know what we need to do, the low-hanging fruit things that we can do to make a difference on this course. And I'd also like to thank um, Mr. Dunleavy and Mr. Chibot at uh, Down to Earth Golf. Uh, they started working on this over a year ago, before we even talked about having a contract. And they helped us define what as is means. And uh, they uh, did an analysis of the course to tell us from a maintenance perspective what we needed to do. They've been most helpful in setting up the business of the golf course. And so I wanted to thank them as well. And lastly, I wanted to thank the HOA, uh, their unwavering support of everything we were doing. And so as you can see, Mayor, this is one of those true things where it took a village to uh, make it happen. So I just wanted to thank everyone for uh, for all their uh, participation in this project. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. Can I ask a quick question? Yes, sir. When are we going to have our food license and uh, hopefully, beer license? Hopefully very, very soon. I know that is Mr. Dunleavy's top priority right now. So. Okie dokie. That's Good. all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Colbert, anything for us? Just to say it's good to be here, good to see everyone again, but I have no items to add to the discussion tonight. Well, it's always good to see you. Uh, Council Member Britton, you're up. A couple quick items. Uh, one, I did uh, did play in the Seminole State uh, Golf Tournament today and did speak with uh, Dr. McGee, and uh, she's excited to, to sit down and talk with us and share with us what, uh, what they uh, came up with and some of the comments they received at their their uh, workshop that they had a few weeks ago so I'd, I'd be uh, anxious to make that sooner than later that meeting with them so work on that uh, I don't know how the Easter egg hunt went Drew but uh, I assume it went well good good and uh, just about the golf course real quick, uh, I'm excited about it. Uh, we do have the Relay for Life uh, tournament coming up at the end of the month. Brian, can we expect to have the food and concessions up by then? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. 
I'd, I'd like to see that become uh, the first showcase for us. Let's put on a good show for the, the folks that come out to that and uh, show them a good time and show them what we can do. And then finally, we have, uh, we have someone with us that's leaving us, Ms. Jenna. I just want to thank you for your service and uh, for all you've done for us. You've been here how many years? Twelve years. So you've uh, covered a lot of ground, so I, I want to thank you for your service. That's all I have. Great. Thank you. Uh, my report's next, and other than to wish you well and thank you for all your years here with us, we do appreciate it, Jeno. Uh, I have no report tonight. Uh, Councilmember Pollock, you're up. Um, I really don't have uh, too much more. The uh, marshmallow drop was, was great. My, uh, my kids enjoyed themselves there and uh, run around chasing marshmallows. Um, I, I recorded uh, the, the 9 to 12 year olds, which was, which was crazy to watch because they're, they're very quick and there was a lot of them. Um, so it was a great, and the, the vendors there were awesome um, as well. Um, that, was, that was really nice to put together. Um, and Jenna, um, we're going to miss you. Deputy Mayor. All right, just a couple things. I'll just piggyback. Jeno, really, that's been a long time, and we know uh, sometimes we don't see you often, but we know a lot of the things that the city has were a lot of your hard work, so we appreciate that. I think your stamp when you're around Oviedo, you'll always see your, your work, So, and it was work well, well done. So good luck to you. I'm sure wherever you're going, they are lucky they're getting a, a gem, so best of luck to you. And uh, Chief White, you know, I mean, the thank yous just keep rolling in. I'm just going to say it. I've said it to you a million times, as probably the whole city has. But, um, you know, we, we fight fires well here. And uh, you guys saved a lot of homes and put a lot of lives back together over the past couple weeks. So, um, you know, it is noticed, recognized by everybody. Little kids leaving your signs in the street. Um, we know we had a lot of other agencies out there. but. You know, my goodness, you know, you just don't know what a day is going to bring. I was in my backyard that day, and I just see this look like somebody dropped a bomb coming over. I was like, what is that? And then, then it just sprung into whatever it is. You know, friends that we know that live out in Live Oak that we see just, you know, ever so thankful that, you know, you guys saved their home. So, um, and the police department for standing guard, keeping all the people out of there so they could do their job. You know, this was a team effort. Police were not holding the hose, but police were a very big part of, uh, of the response out there. So I just want to say thank you for keeping our city from burning to the ground. Excellent job. So uh, other than that, everything's good, Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Slicker. Yes, thank you for keeping our city from burning to the ground. That was super dramatic there. I love it. Uh, well, that was dramatic. If you it saw was. It, those pictures, that was, that, that was that, awesome. That could have been bad. <laughs> I uh, just want to make you guys aware of a few things coming up. Uh, May 7th through 13th is the North American Occupational Safety and Health Week, officially here in Oviedo. Uh, the reason for the proclamation is that 4,600 workers a year die uh, on the job. So if you know any, I, I, I know somebody fell off a roof for that uh, and, and passed away here in our community. So it's, it's, it's a day that, the, that we keep people in mind. Uh, also, uh, May 4th is the official day of prayer here in Oviedo. I uh, was passed on the consent agenda, and also May 6th, Arbor Day. And uh, according to that proclamation, we are to plant trees to gladden the hearts of future generations. So I hope all of you will consider gladdening hearts out there. Plant a tree. We've got great trees available through the city. Uh, one other thing, I am excited about the golf course. I know a lot of people probably think I'm a, a party pooper on, on a lot of fronts. But now that we have it, I think it, it would be wise for us to add perhaps as a discussion item if there's consensus ways that we can ensure that a future council will not develop on it uh, and talking with uh, oh now blanking on his name he, he works with the company on the Seminole Soil Water Conservation District but not David Mankin, that's who it is. It is David Mankin. Uh, when, when we met to, with city staff, he was explaining that if we just straight up put a conservation easement on it, that may limit its use as a golf course and that it may inhibit our ability to get grants down the road. But I, I, if you guys are okay with it, I think in the next, I'd like to see in the next month us discuss how we can permanently keep it from having houses on it. Can I just say one thing? 
we can't bind future councils what they do. All we can do is what we've said we've done. It has the, the public lands on it. It would make it very difficult. And honestly, I think we just got to let this go forward now. Let's let's get down to earth out there. You know, we, we don't. It doesn't, we can it doesn't, do all of that, but in my opinion, it doesn't need any more touch. Brian summed it up really well. This it doesn't well, it doesn't slow down anything. But I'm just giving you my opinion, okay. and my opinion is is that we got to let it go forward now. I don't want to have any more workshops on the golf course. I want to see it be successful and move on. And I think after four years of sitting here, you know, we have it done. And we got a plan. Let's just execute it. And in six months from now, if we need to tweak stuff, we're we're good. That's how I feel. We have three others to talk about. It. You just stated that it would limit the our, our no, it would not. It would oh, not not necessarily. There are things that we can do to keep it from having houses that does not limit its ability to be used as a golf course or for any other purpose we may have. Um, there is has been talk about moving the, the ponds down there, uh, the rapid infiltration ponds, and that would not be conducive with having a conservation easement. So uh, just a discussion to start exploring that because if we allow, uh, if we don't add some protections, then what was about to happen to purchase the golf course could happen to the golf course itself at a time when land is scarcer. If the budget is tight, a future council may say, hey, why don't we hawk 50 acres of this and put houses on it? I, I think that would undermine everything that was just accomplished with its acquisition. Mr. Mayor. Let's, I think it's a good idea, but I, I'd like to just decompress on the golf course for a couple months. And, Fair and, enough. And do some, you know, let it go, like uh, Deputy Mayor says. Uh, I think eventually we'll have to get to that point. Maybe, maybe sometime at the end of this year, have staff start looking into those kinds of ideas, and and then we'll we'll pick it up. But right now, yeah, I think we we just need some time to breathe and let the, enjoy the what we've accomplished. All right, seed planted. Okay. That's all for me. All righty. Future meeting dates, we have uh, Monday, April 24th, 6 p.m. Is it, uh, well, are we doing a budget workshop? Uh, actually, Mayor, I don't think we are. We're going to cancel that? I, I thought I heard something about uh, <coughs> nothing new to add. Is that what I heard? Canceled, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So next meeting then is going to be uh, Monday, May 1st, uh, 5.30 p.m. CRA meeting. Monday, May 1st, 6.30 p.m. We have our regular session following that. Monday, May 15th. Uh, 6.30 p.m. is a regular session. Is there anything else for the good of the order? Just going to add one thing on the golf course. I agree 1,000%. It's been four years to get this thing here. We just need to let it settle. And as a reminder, as public lands, we hold a lot of public lands all over the place. So let's not fixate on the golf course. Well, we almost traded 50 acres of public land and rezoned it to be houses to get the golf course. That's what I'm concerned about. Having or, or since you weren't here, perhaps the strategy was to delay so that we could get a favorable terms to buy it. Maybe the intent never was. Adjourned.